Well, good morning, Via Church. How's everyone doing? Good. Merry Christmas. You guys look great. A little chill in the air, some clouds, and uh, we'll enjoy it while it's here. What a great time to be able to worship God. And thank you for your generosity. These weeks of giving, as we look outside of our walls and we also look uh, to our church family and those that are in need, your giving makes a difference. And uh, so often when you're in my spot at, uh, at a great church like this, you have stories that you you sort of know, but you can't tell them all because they're sort of very personal stories. But we have one story uh, that came to us via email this last week um, of, a, of a mom in a family that received some of the gifts that you brought last week. And we've asked if we can share this with you. And uh, so this is from Tanya. She said this in an email. She said, hi, we got the gifts. Thank you. Wow. And she screamed that because it's all capitals. Okay. Um, wow. I, I wasn't expecting so many gifts from my boys. Wow. I'm just overwhelmed with joy. Thank you so much. We started attending Via Church this year together as a family after my husband and I were remarried in August. And I can't tell you how much we have grown in Christ and as a family since attending Via Church. Every single need we have had has been met a uh, over and above what we've asked for. The support we have found at Via Church is just more than we could ever have ever, ever imagined. I also attend Celebrate Recovery there, and I am so grateful that it is available. Via has helped our family in so many ways, I can't say enough. Sometime soon, I will sit down and write it all down. I want to share our testimony so that you can know that the work <clears throat> that you all do every day is really making such a huge impact in so many lives. God bless you all. I don't have words to describe how much Via Church has brought to, uh, into our lives. You truly do demonstrate the love of our Lord Jesus, without a doubt, and you are all teaching us and so many others how to love and to live the true meaning of Christmas all year round. Thank you, Tanya. Isn't that beautiful? And uh, what a great thing. And I just want you to know that when you give and when you do those things, those are lives and hearts and people that are touched. And I'm so grateful that to be a part of a church that affects lives all throughout the year. And so thank you for your generosity. Well, we're going to uh, dive into uh, today's teaching. And in preparation of doing that, if you take the weekly guide, and this is the actual notes I'll be teaching from today. Also, if you'd uh, open your Bible to Luke chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 39 through 45. If you have a, a Bible with you, great. If not, a chair Bible, page 856, will turn you right to our text. Or if you have a mobile device, viachurch.org slash guide will take you right to these notes and all the scriptures. Um, and also viachurch.org slash give is a great way to be able to give online throughout the week. Well, we have been uh, remembering sort of the pillars of the Advent message um, by lighting a candle each week on our Advent wreath. And um, love, joy, hope, and peace are the pillars of the Christmas message. And so each week we've been talking about that. Today, we're going to be lighting the candle that represents joy in our lives. And the joy of Christ goes beyond circumstance, doesn't it? There was great joy at the original Christmas uh, message and story as God interrupted the silence of mankind with the announcement of the birth of Christ. And God still interrupts our lives, doesn't he? With the gospel message, bringing to us joy, joy unspeakable, joy in spite of circumstances. Could we just thank God right now for the joy that we have in Christ? So, Lord, we have lit this candle reminding ourselves that light, light always triumphs over darkness. Thank you, O oh God, that in the darkness of our sin and in this world, you sent your only begotten Son to take on human flesh and dwell among us, to be Emmanuel, God with us, revealed in us. What joy his birth brought 2,000 years ago and what joy he brings to our hearts today. For it is through Christ that we find new life. It is through Christ, O oh God, that we boldly approach your throne today for his great life and sacrifice and resurrection is where our trust is placed. That today, O oh God, 
you do not look upon us and our sin, but instead you look upon us and see the righteousness of your son Jesus applied to us. What great joy it brings our, heart, our hearts as you have set us free from the bondage of sin and death. What great joy, oh God, that we can have fellowship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. What great joy, oh God, to have your spirit deposited in us, promising our redemption. What great joy, oh God, has come to our hearts that we are a part of a kingdom that will never end. And God, thank you for your grace extended to us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen. Well, you guys are looking good. I hope you have your Christmas shopping done. If you don't, get out there, get it done. I was talking to a few of you men, and you're, some of you aren't doing anything for your wives. At least pick up a card, okay? At least pick up a card. Chocolates go a long way, and Walgreens has got it all. So go ahead and go to Walgreens, get some chocolate. If you really want to go all out, go get some Godiva chocolates. That's the best chocolates out there. So make sure you're doing something. Men, don't just lay around and watch TV. Go get a gift and a card, right? All right. This is not the Lord speaking, but it is me. Well, Luke chapter 1, verse 39 through 45, and uh, we will be looking today. We have been learning how uh, Christmas really is this, these two major stories going on. There is the cosmic story of redemption. God is redeeming his creation. This long-awaited Messiah was coming, and his birth would affect everyone thereafter, including us. Christ has come, but Christ will come again. There's this grand redemptive narrative of God. But then as we read the Christmas story, we find these details, these details of human lives, people like you and me, that were used by God in powerful ways to bring about his purposes. And so we're going to uh, read today of an encounter of Mary, who would be the mother of Jesus, with a relative, Elizabeth. So let's stand for the reading of God's word as we look at this encounter. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears. The baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a, a, a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. So, Father, as we look at this human story that happened, we also see the massive redemptive story that's happening. And so, God, now... We look to the lives of Mary and Elizabeth. We look to those that you chose to use. And God, we find characteristics in them that challenge us. Lord, we are your servants. We long to be used by you, God, in profound ways and in very ordinary ways day after day to bring blessings to, uh, to, blessing to others. So Lord, thank you for this gospel message that we could gather this fourth Sunday of Advent, look to your word, remind ourselves of the gospel, and encourage each other to live a life of faith and humility before you. Thank you for each person here. Bless them richly now as we gather around your word. And everyone said, amen, amen. Wish somebody a Merry Christmas as you're seated, would you? Amen. 
And we hope to see you back on Christmas Eve this Thursday night, December the 24th, Christmas Eve. And we uh, look forward to having you worship with us. Well, the, the heart of this message is that Christ is come and Christ is coming again. At that first advent, some were prepared, but some were not prepared for his arrival. And as we await today in 2015, as we look at this redemptive story, as we await his promises of the second coming, we must be a prepared people. We must be expectant. We must be faithful. We've got to be humble, waiting, praying, and open for God to use us as he accomplishes his redemption plan. And so we see these two stories, and we are reminded that God often uses people for his purposes. One of the things we realize about the, the Christmas story is that God delights in using the weak. He, use, he delights in using the marginalized, the, the humble. He delights in using those that might be on the fringes of society to play significant roles in his work. When we look at the, 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 the Christmas story, there are, uh, it includes people, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth were advanced in years. Elizabeth was barren. We see socially outcast shepherds that are used by God profoundly in the birth of Christ. We see a young teenage girl who is given grace and favor by God. And when we look at these stories, we see these humble beginnings. We see how God delights in using not what the world thinks is great, but what he thinks is great. And the interactions with one another and their interactions with God are very telling and inspiring. And so today, Mary and Elizabeth are relatives. I know that there's a, what, at least one translation over the years that has said that they are cousins, but according to the original languages, it should have never been interpreted as cousins. We just know that they're relatives. We don't know how they're related, but they are relatives. And so this is this, this uh, meeting of Mary and Elizabeth. It takes place in the hill country of Judea, somewhere outside of Jerusalem. This would have been a three-day journey of about 80 to 100 miles from Nazareth. So as we sort of see here that Mary made this journey, a three-day journey, most likely walking 80 to 100 miles to go visit a relative. Sometimes we see like this all happens like, you know, it's like day by day, but can you imagine a three-day journey of 80 to 100 miles? The writer, Luke, really wants to push the significance of this event. And for Luke, as he is writing this gospel account, the significance for him of this event is that John the Baptist and Jesus meet symbolically through their mothers. And John actually starts pointing to Jesus even in the womb, just as predicted. Look back at verses 15 through 17, what it says about John the Baptist. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now that is theologically messy, isn't it? To be filled with the Holy Spirit even in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the, of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. This was not just sort of a short visit according to today's standards. If you look at verse uh, 56, Mary actually stays with Elizabeth for three months. So we just get this account of when she walked in and greeted Elizabeth, but she's going to stay for three months. And Luke aims at the very heart of our text. He, he really points us to Mary and Elizabeth, their responses, the qualities that they possessed, 
And they're qualities that really should be indicative of all believers. And so I want us to sort of look at their posture in this. For God used them in very powerful ways. First of all, Mary took God at his word and we should take God at his word. This text really sort of illustrates Mary's obedience. It reflects her desire to observe the sign that the angel had told her about. Look back at verse 36. It says, and behold, your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. But look at verse 39 of our text today. Mary went with haste to obey where God was taking her. So Mary doesn't waste any time. She hears this. This is, this is about a three-day journey. Um, I have a relative, six months pregnant, John the Baptist, this forerunner to the gospel. She makes haste to go meet Elizabeth. And upon greeting her relative Elizabeth, look at verse 41. It says, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, so much so that it says in verse 44, it talks about her response because what that really means that she's filled with the Holy Spirit is that that God is directing her remarks and her emotions. And in verse 44, it says, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. What an incredible moment. She, she confirms then, she, she goes on to confirm this blessing upon Mary for taking God at his word because she says, blessed is the one who believed that there would be a fulfillment, this is verse 45, of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Has God ever spoken to you something in your heart? Well, we know we have God's written word, don't we? We have God's promises. This is the first and foremost place that we look at God's promises to us, that we take God's word seriously. We must believe that God does what he says. This is a major theme of the narrative of Jesus' birth, are people that would believe what God has said. And the Christmas story shows us over and over again that joy and blessing come to those who believe that God does what he says. Do you believe God does what he says? Yeah. When we, say, when we celebrate Advent, we are really saying we also believe that he will come again. This is our trust in God's word, that God is at work whether we can see him or not, whether our circumstances tell us that he is at work or not, we trust that God is at work. How many of you know God still interrupts our lives? God still intervenes in the lives of his people. He still steps into our human stories. And we should rejoice and trust that he will do as he has promised. And this type of surrender and trust in God's word is contrary to human nature. It's not our nature to simply trust what we cannot see. It's not our nature to trust words from one that we maybe have not seen with our eyes. But Mary's trust in God's word was immediate. Look back at verse 38. When when Mary first heard this word, she said, behold, I am the servant of of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. What a great posture of her heart, trusting that all things are possible with God. This, this word that had come to Mary, you will be with child, was not an easy thing. And she said, how will this be? And when she was told, she said, let it be according to your word. Mary didn't understand, did she? She didn't know how it was all going to happen. And today we still live in days of uncertainty. We know God's promise, but we see things happening around us and we don't know how it's always going to come out, but we trust and we say, God, we are your servant. Let it be to me according to your word. Do you know God's word? Have you hidden God's word in your heart? Do you know his promises for you? 
Can you trust his work for your own good, even when circumstances are challenging? Romans 8, 28, we quote it often as Christ followers. It says, and we know for those that love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. But how many of you have ever found out that when God is working things out for your good, it's not always fun? Right? I mean, we should know this as parents. We do things for our, our kids' good that they don't enjoy. We say, this is what you need to do, but I don't want to. Well, you need to because it's the good thing for you. And God works out his purposes because God cares about the formation of our hearts. He cares about developing us into the people that he desires us to be. So one takeaway from this, when we see Mary that makes haste to go to Elizabeth, is that she took God at his word. Let me encourage you, take God at his word. Second, be amazed at God's involvement in your life. One of the things we see about this entire story is that the child, Jesus, is at the center of God's fresh activities. This whole story is pointing to the birth of Christ. All these activities that are going on, these angels appearing, a forerunner coming, um, uh, uh, God aligning stars, voices from heaven. All of this is pointing to the fresh activity of God, which is Jesus Christ. Today, my friend, Jesus is still the center of God's activities. Jesus is still the center. It is all about Jesus. And God's great cosmic narrative, this redemption, this restoration of his creation through his son, Jesus, it is all about Jesus. And when he involves us in that plan, we should possess an amazement in being a part of God's astounding events. Anytime we ever get to share God's word, anytime we get to reflect his hope to others, anytime that we get to be a blessing to others, we should be amazed that God has used us to proclaim his hope. One thing about Mary and Elizabeth as we look at this is their absolute amazement that they were sharing in the blessings of God. In fact, so much so, Mary breaks out with song. Josh read this a couple moments ago as we began our service. Let's look at verses 46 through 55 and read this amazement. You hear, look for the amazement in Mary's words. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. And he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Do you hear Mary's amazement? She's saying this is what God has done. This is what God is doing. There's amazement that she would be a part of this. What joy we sense in her song. What amazement of God's work. And uh, one of the things that I, when I think about this prepare, preparedness, this expectancy, this joy, this amazement, this comes even today as moms give birth, right? And they're not even bearing the son of God, but we still have preparation and amazement and excitement. And I am going to bring up a very special couple to us. And uh, this is Rob and Catherine Lee and their new little baby, Olivia. And uh, Rob and Catherine started attending Via Church about two years ago. And um, uh, Rob um, joined our team just a couple of months ago as our next generation pastor or uh, working with our students. I'm going to have you guys sit over here. Can I take her? 
I can totally take her. You've had enough, but I have not had enough. This, oh, this is, this is in case something comes out. Okay, <laughs> got that. This is Olivia, and I got to see Olivia in the hospital. So Rob joined our, our staff, and after attending here for a couple of years, um, Rob uh, has, has taken over our, our student ministry, 7th through 12th grade. Rob and Catherine were already um, uh, doing our young adults on Tuesday evenings, and so now they're doing 6th uh, grade through young adults. And um, this couple has been just such a blessing uh, to us. Uh, Rob and Catherine are both from El Paso, Texas. And uh, anybody else from El Paso? <laughs> that was cool. Um, and, uh, and then... Um, they both uh, attended Fuller Theological Seminary out in Pasadena. And then, uh, Catherine, you've, your dad and mom live here in Mesa. And so they came back. Fuller Theological Seminary has a campus here in Phoenix. And uh, Catherine finished. And then Rob just finished um, um, seminary and uh, came on our staff uh, this fall. But in the midst of all this, you graduated from seminary, you had a baby, and you had got a new job. Uh, <laughs> Are you doing okay? I'm hanging in there. I've had some moments. <laughs> but Rob and Catherine, I wanted to, when I thought about this preparing the way, talk to me a little bit about preparation. This is your second child. Ellie is three, right? And uh, so you have this little one running around. Um, you're working for Fuller Theological Seminary, um, and you're finishing seminary. Another baby's coming. Um, then sort of a, a position here at Via Church um, came open, and all these things are happening in your life. Talk a little bit about preparation for Olivia's arrival and some of the things that you did for preparation and what that's been like. Well, the first major point of preparation we did was to move to Arizona. Um, Catherine's family lives here, and we're trying to finish school and have our first child. We know that the second one's coming, so we are actually living with her folks for a season of time. Mm -hmm. uh, wanted grandma and grandpa to be around to help. Uh, yeah. We needed some babysitters uh, on hand at all times, so that was our first major prep preparation. Um, and, you know, everything that goes along with that, you're, you're trying to Figure out the name, you know, um, you, you stock up on diapers, uh, you know, all those small things. Uh, you're laying in as much kind of control the chaos as you can because you know it's about to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and then uh, what's it been like with, with her birth? Just the, the, the joy and the excitement of all of that. And uh, it's got to change the household dynamics a little bit. Yes, definitely. The three-year-old is trying to figure out, now I have competition, and how do I get mommy and daddy's attention when she's changing a diaper? So that's been interesting. Um, yeah, I think it's just kind of embracing a little bit of the chaos and realizing that God is in the midst of that. Um, there have been some just sweet, sweet moments when the two girls first met each other. I just welled up with tears because Ellie, our three-year-old, was so excited about her baby sister, and it's been really wonderful, but also really exhausting at the same time. So. <laughs> okay, we're focusing on joy and amazement right now. Okay. <laughs> Save exhaustion for January 1, you know. No, no but it is. It is. It's, it's, it can be very exhausting. And when I even think about, when I think about Mary and Elizabeth and the story we're talking about, um, most likely Mary's with child. She journeys three days and to go visit. Elizabeth is six months pregnant. And I remember talking to you when you were six months pregnant and you were just ready to be done. And in the midst of all of this, you do. You have this exhaustion. You have this excitement, you have this amazement, sort of all wrapped up into yeah. one. And, uh, and then also just talk to me just about how you sort of seen God in this. As, as you, most of us have, have, we really sense God at that moment where we see our, our children born and just sort of that. Um, I would say um, it's, you play such a small role in, in the bringing a child into this world. So obviously certain things have to happen before you're pregnant. And then for me as a mom, it's like, it's, it's on autopilot, this thing is happening in my body, and I really don't have that much control of it, and that's kind of like grace. I mean, God works through us. There are things that we, we do that can interrupt grace, but ultimately, he's working even though, you know, we play that small part. It's really his work in us that changes us and makes us and conforms us into his image. So 
for me to just experience the pregnancy and to know that this beautiful, miraculous life was being grown in my body um, was just phenomenal and a wonderful metaphor for understanding yeah. God's work in my life. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would often say just in a moment of amazement, there's a human being inside of you. You are growing a human being. You know, it's just, it's just what is happening? Is that really happening? You know, yeah. you start out and there's no sign. And then it, obviously you grow and grow. And it's like, wow. It, it, you know, and that happened with our first. But again, with the second one, it's just overwhelming. Yeah. It's yeah. just God's ability to grow this thing yeah. inside of you that is going to have a personality and unique talents and skills and what is she going to look like? And what is her name? And, yeah. you know, what question after question. And, and yeah. you just have to live in that moment of, yeah. okay, God, I surrender to this process. I surrender because yeah. I can't control all the outcome. I don't know what everything's going to be like. But it is this wonderful anticipation of, of new life. Yeah. And just one other thing, when she was born, you just have this immediate love. The parents out there, you know that this immediate love for this child, you know nothing really about her except there she is. And, and I think that's how God feels about us. There's nothing we can do to earn it. We just simply are his children, and he loves us for that. And it's a phenomenal experience to see that with your own babies. So Yeah. Well, Rob and Catherine, for one, um, just so great to have you guys step into this assignment here at Via Church. And then at a very exciting time of your lives, and uh, Ellie's always uh, just been a part of our a part of us in these last couple of years. Ellie, their three-year-old, um, likes to come into the big church after she gets picked up. She likes to be in this room, so usually they have to come to this room after church um, with her, and she just wants to stand in the back, and we talk, and she's just absolutely adorable. Well, we had uh, scheduled Rob and Catherine to sort of come in and do this, and then uh, just this week, they said, you know what, let's have her dedicated right here and now, and so how about if we do that? We do a dedication, um, both of Olivia uh, to the Lord, and then also um, that this is you guys guys uh, dedicating yourself once again to raise Olivia Lorraine, right? That's her middle name, Olivia Lorraine, in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. So I'm going to have you guys stand, and uh, you guys just need to see. She is the sweetest little thing. I have held her so many times, and she just is content. She's just really content, and she's a good baby, isn't she? God, that's what you prayed for. <laughs> that's that, what I mean. <laughs> That's what I needed, she said. <laughs> I didn't just pray for it. It was, a, it was a requirement, you know. Well, children are our heritage from the Lord. And uh, we think of this, this uh, miracle baby born 2,000 years ago. And I wanted to just bring the human side to all of that, the, the mother side that Mary would have felt. But then Mary being uh, part of the birth of, of God's son. But children are a heritage from the Lord. They are a promise that God still believes in his creation and believes uh, for the future. And Olivia has been given to Rob and Catherine as a gift to them, but also via church. She's a gift to us. And we are to raise children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. So Rob and Catherine, I charge you to live your walk of Christ very um, boldly before Olivia that she would see you praying often, that she would see faithfulness uh, unto the Lord, that she would see you guys working out your differences, being committed to each other, bringing joy in the midst of circumstances. And she agrees with that right now. She just said that. And so, Lord, um, right now we just dedicate Olivia Lorraine Lee to you. Lord, she is a gift not only to the Lees, but also to us. And we pray your blessing upon her right now. We thank you, Lord, for her little life. We thank you for the miracle that she is, and how we see you, and all the wonder of who you are as we look at her. But I pray that at an early age, that she would come to a saving knowledge of who you are. I pray for your protection around Rob and Catherine, Keep them in your care. Protect them from the evil one, we pray. Protect their home. May their marriage covenant that they took before you be fulfilled not only by their faithfulness, but by your faithfulness as well. Lord, as they assume the responsibilities of, of ministering to our students and to young adults, God, may 
both Olivia and Ellie received great blessing being raised in a church family. And God, as a church family, we dedicate ourselves once again to make sure that Via Church is a safe place for children. Lord, a place where they're loved, a place where they're allowed to make mistakes and be cared for. Now we dedicate her to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All of God's people said, amen. 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 I just don't want to give her up. I want to hold her (laughs) for the whole time. Would you uh, just show your love and appreciation to Rob and Catherine? How exciting was that? And uh, you know what? Since we have two services, she's going to be dedicated again next service, so she's going to be doubly dedicated. (laughs) And uh, what an exciting thing. And we also wanted you to be able to meet uh, Rob and Catherine and uh, get to know them. They are a blessing, and uh, we're just so excited to have them with us. Joy. I mean, when you think about babies, you can't help but think about joy. When you're holding a baby, there's something about the joy that you, that you have, this new life, this wonder. Can you imagine Mary's joy? And then this miraculous conception that had all of this mystery around it, a promise that had been in the works for centuries was happening through her and through God. God was at work. It was a big work, a huge moment in the, in the history of God's creation. And he chose to use some willing servants in the midst of it. God, my friend, is still at work. And his plan is way bigger than you and me. And he saves us and he calls us into his mission. Ephesians 2.10 says it well. It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. My friend, he did not save you just to keep you out of hell. He has saved you by his grace and adopted you into his family, which is a missional family, that you might be involved in his work, becoming an ambassador for Jesus Christ. I encourage you to be amazed at God's involvement in your life. This Christmas, as you gather around in the the holy moments of Christmas, those moments where you're finally sitting around the tree and everyone's together and you're ready to celebrate Take a few moments to be amazed at God's involvement in your life. That this gospel story of Jesus would have been brought to you. Another thought that I have from Mary is that she really realized that, and Elizabeth, that God did not owe them anything. And my friend, God does not owe you anything. The amazement exists, this kind of amazement exists only when there's a humility of heart. God owes you nothing. Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, is honored just to be in the presence of Mary and her Lord. Look at verse 43. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth knows that God does not owe her such a central role in his grand plan. She senses that she does not even deserve to be where she finds herself in this story. What humility! What humility! And this kind of humility, when we have that humbleness of heart, which is a beatitude, is a natural product of reflection about who God is. I have found in my life that the more I reflect upon who God is and his greatness and his power, I begin to realize that I get smaller in my thoughts. You see this deep sense of respect and awe and wonder that Mary and Elizabeth had that really inspired this kind of humility. After all, he's the creator who's responsible for our being a part of creation. And we should appreciate the honor of what it means to know God. We must revel in his grace, his undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor. This is really the opposite of human entitlement. We live in a day and age today where entitlement is huge. Everyone believes they deserve something. And this should not exist in our thinking about God. 
fact, scriptures say, what is man that you are mindful of him? And culture sort of teaches this entitlement that you deserve these things and that, and that God owes you something. And this can get, begin to creep into our thinking and can begin to creep into church life. My friend, to have that humbleness of heart, to realize that we are servants of God, humbly and graciously used by God. So God owes us nothing, but you owe Christ everything. We who have trusted Christ owe him him everything. He's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Romans 12.1 tells us what our reasonable act of worship should be. Because of what Christ has done, taking us out of this darkness, bringing us into the light and the knowledge of Christ, Paul tells the Roman church, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, look what he says, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The pastor of Mary and Elizabeth sort of reflects this type of surrender, living your life in glad service to the one who has saved you is the proper response to the gospel message. Our entire life should be a reflection of the grace that we have received. This means that as we receive the grace and the forgiveness of Christ, as we trust this gospel message that God so loved the world that he sent his son, when we trust the life and teachings and miracles of Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and trusting his word that he is alive today and at the right hand of God the Father, when we trust that, we begin to realize that our lives must be lived as worship back to God for this gracious gift that's been given to us. Paul paints this picture, Romans chapter 12, and a couple of verses later, he sort of talks about this. He talks about living our lives as, 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 as living sacrifices before God. Look at the tall order that he puts to those of us that would trust this message. Verse nine, he says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. My friend, our only reasonable act of worship is to live such lives back to Christ in worship. As you read that, anybody else feel any conviction when you read that at all? We read that and we say, wow, that is like all of life, all for Christ. This, you can just begin to see this calling because of what Christ has done. We owe Christ everything. This humble life spent to bless others is worship to God. There's a cost to being a disciple. Response is necessary. Salvation is free, but it'll cost you everything. There must be response to our salvation and it cannot be half-hearted. Instead, as a follower of Christ, we give our entire lives to him as worship. And there's no greater joy 
than to live a life fully surrendered to the Savior. This Christmas, my prayer for you as your pastor is that you will be full of joy, that you will reflect the hope of Christ, that your lives will be lived as worship to him and say he owed us nothing, but I owe him everything. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? So God, we thank you for the power of your word. And we take you at your word. We trust this written word inspired by your spirit. We trust your word that has bore witness in our hearts by your spirit. And we trust again today in this salvation given to us through Jesus Christ. God, help us to be amazed at your involvement in our lives. Help us to see every good gift has been given to us by you. God, never, may we never believe, God, that you owe us something. But may our lives be lived in humble service to you, recognizing that we owe Christ everything. We thank you for the holiness, God, of this season. And Lord, we just wait in your presence right now and we ask, Lord, speak to us and drive home truth in our hearts. I just encourage you right now just to, to listen to the Lord and also to respond in your own heart. In the rush moments of this season that can often bring just in stillness right now. Give your heart to the Lord, would you? Heavenly Father, as we enter into these next few days of celebration, may our hearts be restored by you through the work of your Spirit, by the work of your Spirit, may you bring us the hope, the love, and the peace, and the joy of Christ. As we gather with family and friends, May those characteristics mark us that we might bless others that we might reflect your character and this message by our very lives we give you our hearts once again and I pray in the midst of all of the celebration this week that our hearts would be humble and worship you this week in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, thanks for those moments of reflection. We're going to sing one more song, but we're going to give you an opportunity today to give in a benevolence offering. Let me tell you about our benevolence fund here at Via Church. This is our emphasis of giving for this weekend. We have a fund that's just marked benevolence. Benevolence is a, a kind act done to someone in need. And throughout the year, we have a process, an approved process for those that are in our church family, that when they have a crisis, that they can turn to their church family and say, would you be able to help me? And so all throughout the year, sometimes it happens multiple times in a week, we have folks in our church family that regularly attend via church 
and they have, maybe have a crisis. Maybe they're between jobs. Maybe there's been a death in their family. Maybe there's a, a, an illness. Maybe there's a crisis in their marriage and somehow the funds are not there to be able to get through that situation. And so the Benevolence Fund helps us to sort of make those ends meet together. Sometimes it, it helps towards rent or towards a mortgage payment. Sometimes it pays a utility bill and keeps the utilities on through the crisis. Sometimes if there's a marriage that's in trouble, these funds will help to, uh, to subsidize some marriage counseling. And so throughout the year, we sort of tap into this fund. And uh, uh, that fund, of course, throughout the year sort of begins to sort of go down. And uh, that, the, that fund now is getting down to sort of a critical moment. That's where we put it on one of our at Sundays of, of giving through Christmas. And by this offering today, my prayer, my hope, our hope is that that fund will have a high enough balance that we can go into the new year beginning to take care of families again and be able to do that. Even over the last couple of weeks, we've fulfilled a number of requests out of this fund. And uh, this is our opportunity as a church family to share with those that are in need in our own church family. And uh, we do this in ways that have great accountability, but also that protect privacy and don't embarrass anyone. But it's powerful ways when families in our church say, wow, to be a part of a church family that cares and walked us through this. And uh, so would you uh, now uh, just prepare this offering on the line that says other, you can write benevolence. Uh, if you gave in the first offering and you wrote benevolence, that, of course, will be honored for benevolence. Anytime you mark that, it's only used for this account. So the ushers are coming forward right now. You guys have been so generous as you have reached out with, uh, uh, with food and uh, with donating of time in 2016, last week with the gifts and the stockings, and uh, bless you as you uh, now partner together, as we partner together to be able to worship God this way in our benevolence fund. So Father, thank you for an opportunity again to give back to you. You've been so good to us. And you, you call us a New Testament life to share with those that are in need, to share resources together. And so, Lord, now we give these to you. And we give it with a glad and cheerful heart, knowing that families will be helped in our faith community. And so, Lord, we give them to you. I pray, Lord, that you would help us as a church always to be able to help those that are in need. Bless this act of worship right now in Christ's name. Everyone said, amen, amen. Let's worship the Lord and we'll just dismiss him with a benediction in just a moment.